Hello, it's Mark Lowry from theaterjones.com. I am here with Kevin Moriarty, the Artistic Director of the Dallas Theater Center. We're going to talk a little bit about the pandemic and what's in store for DTC in the coming months and in the coming season. And of course, a lot of this is already up in the, it's still up in the air because there are a lot of questions, you know, nobody can answer at this point. Uh, but first of all, Kevin, tell me why a lot of people talk about when when theaters are going to return in their normal houses, in their spaces, a lot of people think it's really mainly about making sure the audience is safe, and that's a big part of it. But we're also really concerned, especially with theater, about actors and crew and staff. I know there's a lot of business backstage. Could you kind of explain to our viewers, you know, why it's so important and why it's so complicated? Yeah, you're exactly right, Mark. When the pandemic first hit and we had to close everything down, I pictured that the challenges of reopening would be about the audience. And indeed, that's been really challenging. But as a country, we've started to find throughout all industries, including the arts, including in Dallas throughout the Arts District, um, kind of ways of keeping people safe. Stay six feet apart, wear a mask, have social distance. So you can start to see that. Folks go to movie theaters now. Folks go to the art museums or to the symphony. And so a lot of my friends and family and a lot of our audience say, well, why can't you just open up your theater and be just like you know, the art museum or the movie theater? And um, the answer is, it's the artists that are the real challenge. As anyone knows who's ever done even a high school play in, in their life, backstage is a really complicated space in a theater typically before right before you go out on stage you're waiting like in the wings and typically there's a whole bunch of people all jammed together uh, waiting to go on and then you rush out on stage you sing and dance singing as we well know is one of the most dangerous things to do as is talking really loudly because you know you spit more <laughs> and the spit is you know that's that's how we transmit the coronavirus so you so first you're jammed together in a closed space backstage you run out on stage with no mask presumably you do a whole bunch of dangerous singing then you go running off stage and typically what happens is you are greeted by a team of people whose job is to hand you a prop meaning they've touched it now you're touching it whose job is to change your clothes meaning literally they grab the clothes on you which are often you know velcroed or whatever they rip them off they put them back on they push you back into the crowded wing and then you run out on stage so if you just think of that little journey i've described how many points of intimate contact there is in any play over the last you know, 2,500 years. All of that since mid-March has been um, determined to be unsafe. So it poses real challenges for, um, for all of us as we try to recraft how backstage works, how the physical infrastructure of the theater that supports that works, the heating, the air conditioning system, ventilation, um, and then once you're out on the stage, most significantly, how do you keep the actors safe? It, it, at least backstage, you could imagine dressers, props people, they're all in masks. But on stage, you know, if, if you have to keep everybody at least six feet apart, well, almost every play, one of two things happens if there are actors actors on stage. They either want to kiss each other or they want to hit each other. Like that's kind of the history of drama <laughs> is that characters either are compelled toward love or, or, or move toward hatred. Two things you should not do in a pandemic. Get really, really close to somebody, hug them or kiss them, or get really close to them and hit them. So essentially all of the tools of the trade, not just the um, audience part, are suddenly really challenging. Yeah, and you didn't even mention, for example, the prop table backstage, where there often is a lot of props that maybe multiple characters touch. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it touch each. Think how many plays have food in them. Again, things that we think, oh, well, you wouldn't want to have multiple people touching the same uh, food. So something just as simple as um, a play where somebody says, oh, I need you to sign this piece of paper. Uh, or I'm going to hand you some money, a very normal thing to happen in a play. But most of us in our lives for the last six months have been trying to do contactless, you know, money. And you go to a, a, a place where you need to use a pen and they have the dirty jar and the clean jar for the pen that they hand you or whatever. So all everything on stage is now really complicated. 
Right. And in addition to singing and talking loudly, as you mentioned, being extra dangerous because of the, the spit, uh, another thing would be like a brass instrument. So you could not do mu the music man, for instance. Right. Exactly. So we're, we are hoping to, so for instance, for our theater um, at Dallas Theater Center, and we work closely with multiple unions as well. So the actors union, the directors union, which I'm part of the designers union, we're working with those unions to, as, as well as with medical professionals and, and experts in public health, to try to craft a way that we can come back and do something that looks pretty much like a play for the audience, but that handles all of those challenges. So the first thing we're hoping to do, and I'm not certain that we'll be able to do it, but I'm hoping we'll be able to do, will be some version of Christmas Carol, but it won't be able to remotely be the normal version. It'll have to be a version where there's only five or six actors, where they are all social distance from each other, so nobody get close, can't have any kids, can't have any singing, can't have any dancing, these are all things, we, can't do any offstage quick costume changes, can't have any live instruments, or at least no instruments that you blow into, things like that. Um, so in order, so we're trying to figure out, using Christmas Carol as our test case, um, how we can get something up that will follow all of those requirements, which, and on top of that, if you think about one of the signature things of the Wiley Theater and of Dallas Theater Center's artistic innovation is we love to play with space and the audience relationship. You think of all the times that we've crammed the audience close together in a tiny little space in the basement or on the sixth floor, or the time that we've been in the round or in a thrust, or the times audience actors have climbed all over the audience. All of those things are impossible in a pandemic. So even the theater configuration can't be our normal Christmas Carol configuration, a thrust stage with the audience on all three sides and the actors very close to the audience. We'll have to be in a proscenium stage, a picture frame that you look straight at, and the audience will have to be far away from the front of the stage so the actors won't even be able to do like in, you know, I don't know, Gypsy or something, where like Mama Rose goes all <laughs> the way to the edge of the stage and belts out as loud as she can. That can't happen in a pandemic. The last thing you, know, you just picture a singer going straight to the edge of the stage to sing the big song and all the audience in the front row scrambling back to get away from the singer. So um, it's unique challenges. Yeah, yeah. And right now, because of where we are with the pandemic and the area of the country we're in, there's gonna, there would have to be reduced capacity seating. So you have to have, what, only a few people on each row and sort of spaced out. Yeah, we've mapped out in the Wiley Theater, so we set it up as a proscenium space, and then we've mapped out if anybody buys a ticket, it'll automatically in the software, we've got new software that will allow us to do this, it'll automatically block out six feet of empty seats on both sides of their party. So you could come in one, two, three, four people. You can all, if you come as a pod, you know, your family can all come together, the people you've quarantined with, but then by purchasing that seat, it automatically will block out six feet worth of space next to you and in front of and behind you. The result of that is that if we sell every single ticket we can sell safely, it comes out at about 30% capacity. That, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think of the number of times in my life I've sat in a theater that was only 30% full. It's very, very, I mean, that, that no theater uh, artist wants to be a theater that's 30% full. And in this case, a sold out house for us will be 30% full. So that's a very different world for the audience experience. And frankly, it's a really different economic experience because you, you just can't afford to run a theater on 30% of the box office. Right, right. And you and a lot of places have like eliminated intermission. So there's uh, less chance of activity between you have to look at how you people enter into the chamber. Yeah, you don't want people you never want anybody bunched up in the process in the audience or, or backstage, but in the audience, that would mean that we're going to need to have ways to social distance the audience. We're going to have to think about what time people arrive and ensure that that's spread out. We're going to need to ensure that there's the smallest amount of contact of people with physical objects. So that might mean, for instance, having all the bathroom doors propped open so that you don't have to physically open those. You're right with intermission. That's a, normally at any intermission of any play, everybody lines up at a concession or walks around and talks to their friends in the audience. We, we want to discourage all of that. So we'll eliminate intermissions. 
um, uh, so so it, it, if food, any any concessions would need to be not only efficiently given out, but also presumably prepackaged and and sealed so that you know it's as simple and and safe as possible. Um, even things like one of one of the things I most love about plays at Dallas Theater Center is at the end of every performance of every play, we invite the audience to stay late and have a conversation about the play they just saw. Well, in the pandemic world, we don't want everybody to take their masks off, get close to each other and talk. So even things like a post-show conversation will have to be a post-show virtual conversation, you know, throughout the run of a show, we'll be able to find ways that we can hold virtual convening. So if you saw the show a couple days ago, you can come online and in a Zoom room, talk with artists and other audience members. Um, e even deep traditions like, um, like opening nights, we simply won't have opening nights because you know the, <laughs> the the history of theater is the history of actors on opening night gathering together and having a drink and and you know hooping and hollering and all that. Well, we don't want uh, folks uh, uh, taking off their masks to eat or drink. So you know, opening night might mean that we hand the actor a little pre-sealed you know um, uh, champagne bottle and a <laughs> and a chocolate bar and say go eat this at home and <laughs> not here. Right, right. It's the world for until we get the vaccine and and we can return to a more full social gathering right and another complication for your process would be how do you rehearse a show i mean i, I know a lot of readings and initial rehearsals are done via zoom but there's some point where you've got to be in the space right i mean i think that's absolutely critical um we just so for christmas carol which is the first show we're hoping to do um, we've got the audience safety protocols um, figured out and approved by various um, health experts. We just had the my union, the director's union, just cleared our safety and health protocols that we submitted to them for me to go in a rehearsal room. We don't yet have that approval from the actors union, which is really carefully studying a 50 page safety proposal that we gave to them. And um, their primary concern uh, on that is the case counts in North Texas. So the, what the National Actors Union is looking at is local data that the government releases. Now anybody in Dallas knows, or Texas in fact, knows that one of the challenges with the case counts that the county and the state are putting out is that they are, have been including for months um, inaccurate information. Originally in the summer, they were not counting things, cases by mistake. Now they're trying to make up for that. So our case counts are apparently higher than maybe they actually are. Every day we hear about this from Clay Jenkins and from Mayor Johnson and others, but that's what the National Union's looking at. But you're right, in terms of the rehearsal room, the thing that the director's union most wanted to focus on in our safety plans were how the, that rehearsal process would work. That I'll be in a mask, the actors, though the actors on stage in performance could perform without masks, we'll want them to be rehearsing in masks whenever that's at all possible. And we'll need to really limit the number of people in the room. So normally in a rehearsal room, press people come in and out, um, staff members, marketing folks, development staff, um, artistic staff come in to give notes, people come in to watch. Um, other actors might sit around in a rehearsal and people get close to each other. I mean, a very standard tool that I would use in directing is I'd watch a scene as close as I can physically to the action. I'll get as close as I can in a rehearsal room. Then if something's happening really good or something I really want to explore with an actor, I might stand up, walk up right to them, kind of take them aside and have a conversation, you know, a, a quiet conversation about, hey, let's try the scene again, but what if we did it this way? Everything I've just described is not possible. I can't get near the actors. I can't take them aside. I certainly, I can't even talk quietly because yeah, we got to communicate through our masks and all of that. Um, so we're, we're all going to be in, um, we're going to try to eliminate um, physical things like paper. So, you know, when, when we do rewrites on a script, we'll have to think really carefully about how do we distribute this electronically. But again, a very standard thing in a rehearsal process mm -hmm. is to say, you know, hey, wait, let me rewrite this quick. Let's print something up. Here's new pages. So even something as simple as that um, has to be fully interrogated so that before you ever get to performance, everybody's safe. And, and yeah. that's way into details of things like, you know, testing and all of that. It, it, it just, it, every time you think you've solved something, you realize, in coronavirus, there's always more to solve. Right. I wonder if at some point someone's going to develop some kind of software for theaters that would help a director actually 
block a space all you know virtually like there's an actual blueprint i would ex well first of all i truly truly pray that this crisis is solved with you know a vaccine and appropriate in national and international public health policy before anybody has the time to finish that innovation. <laughs> but I'm certain that there are so many folks thinking in really innovative ways. Even look at like some of the stuff the NBA is doing where they have devices on that if they get within six feet of somebody, it starts beeping. So that um, if, you know, if two players, you know, just a after the, the game back at the hotel or whatever, get within six feet. Every, and the press, it's the same way that any of the press that are in the bubble with the NBA have to wear those. So, you know, the amount of technological innovation that is trying to find a way to hold America together at a time when a, a global crisis is literally physically pulling everyone apart and isolating them. It's, I'm in awe, not only of the first responders, but of just the tenacity of everybody trying to find a way to make meaningful life right. in a meaningless time. Right. And can you tell me about, I know you recently announced what you're going to do with Public Works, which is a great program you've had for three years now. And it's a real shame that the community won't be able to participate in something like that this year. Hopefully it's back next year. Tell us what you're doing. Yeah, so our, our Public Works program, which is our deep uh, community engagement program is a year-round program much of the year nine months of the year we're in working with our community partners at centers all across the city where we do free workshops for uh, kids and senior citizens folks of all ages um, exploring acting or singing or or, or movement and all, uh, writing all of that stuff all of that work throughout the pandemic has been continuing, but those workshops have all gone online. So for instance, our playwright in residence, Jonathan Norton, um, led a group of, of um, community members, the vast majority of whom had never in their life written a play. And they, they ranged from retired folks uh, to teenagers, all, all gathering in a Zoom room for weekly playwriting um, classes and exercises. And that resulted, the end of that, um, that couple month exploration resulted in a showcase performance that happened on Zoom, where the writers themselves, the community members were performing alongside guest artists and sharing their work with each other. So I was able to jump into the Zoom room, watch the work that everybody had created, and then even you know lift it up and celebrate it and all that. Now normally, I'd be in my car driving to different community centers. I'd be out at Beckley Center or out at Bachman Lake together, and I'd you know be able to actually sit down and watch a show and friends and family would, would clap and all of that. All of that is moved online. Similarly, as since we can't gather in person to make art, but we're trying to find ways to keep um, providing opportunities for folks to unlock their artistic potential, we have joined together as part of a national public works movement to do something that, that, it, that we're calling a seed project. And the, the seeds that we're inviting people to plant are seeds of hope for the present and the future. And whereas normally, if we were gonna think about planting seeds of hope, our tools to do that would be we'd move throughout the community and create plays and create theater about that with community members. Okay, we can't do that. So instead, we've been distributing chalk to people, socially distanced, safe, drop off and pick up places, and inviting people all ages all over the city to go outside with their mask on and create um, a work of visual art, a chalk project, and then somehow capture that, whether that's video or photography, and share it with us and then we're compiling that um, in um, compilation uh, video in still images for Dallas so that we can capture here's our city making art of hope even though it's predominantly visual rather than than theatrical and then we're sharing all of that with our national cohorts the public theater in New York or Seattle rep in Seattle for instance so we'll be able to bring all that work together um, again, in a digital space and ultimately be able to see here are the seeds of hope that um, are being planted artistically speaking um, from folks literally across the country. But the, the biggest thing that we do in public works and would have done in July of this year is our big massive um, live theatrical production where we bring 200 folks together from all those communities around Dallas to do a big massive play. We're gonna do Twelfth Night this year, a musical of Twelfth Night, uh, a really awesome Broadway musical of Twelfth Night directed by Christy Vela. 
um, with 200 community members. We were deep in, the designs were done, we were ready to go into community auditions um, in March when the pandemic hit. So we've had to put that off until next summer and we're still very much hoping that'll happen next summer in July. Having said that, as much as I have hope and I'm, I'm fighting to have hope every day. I mean, I'm actively pursuing hope in my, um, in my workspace and frankly, even in my, my soul as an individual, like so many others are. Uh, I have to acknowledge that, you know, we can't gather 200 people on stage at the Wiley Theater until there is a safe and effective vaccine that ensures people are safe. I mean, there's no, there's no way to socially distance 200 people indoors. That, that, you know, we might be able, working with the unions and public health leaders uh, by Christmas Carol or by later next year to find a way to socially distance five, six, seven actors under the strictest of circumstances. But 200 people of all ages, it's not gonna happen until the national and international community find a way forward. But I think it is still possible that we could get a vaccine at some point in the, the fall or the winter, that that vaccine could be equitably and widely shared in a responsible way. And hopefully by next summer, we can fill the theater with audience members and we can fill the stage with 200 community members. And boy, oh boy, if that's possible, we're doing that awesome 12th thing. <laughs> you may have to, and you, you've already done this, but you may have to just stick with doing some Greek plays where the actors would wear masks uh, and it's outdoors and you promenade them and everyone's distant. Yeah, I think, you know, if we, if we can't find a way to, because we're approaching the winter and, be, and so it, we're thinking, oh, the, the kind of first thing that we want to do is find that safe way to do a small version, an innovative new version of Christmas Carol uh, scaled down for safety indoors. But if we find that that's not possible, if, if the unions working with us can't ensure that this is safe for everybody involved, then um, we'll switch to digital work. Our plan all season long, anything we do live this season, our subscribers and single ticket buyers both will have the opportunity to select either a live production or they could see that same production done virtually. So we'll be doing both. If it's not safe to perform live, if, if we can't make that happen, then we will do a virtual only production. So no matter what, we'll at least be creating art and sharing it. Right. But if we're in that world where it's not safe to produce live indoors, but the unions work with us to determine it is safe to do something outdoors, whether that's far away outdoors or whether that's wearing masks in cars, whatever it takes, I'm gonna do anything <laughs> that it takes to get six plays to happen between you know uh, late November and July no matter what and our plan is to do that with that mix of indoor performances that if you aren't comfortable coming indoors you could you could access virtually but um, but if but if somebody says Kevin you're never gonna get actors indoors but you can get them outside that's it we're going outside and if they say you can only be outside if the audience is you know, driving by or wearing headphones or a mile away then we're going to somehow find a way to do that. Yeah, I mean, the good news is that the uh, AT&T Performing Arts Center in the Arts District has ample outdoor space to perform in. Right, right, and, and that is great. We are on our campus, we have that space and that's a really encouraging thing. So that's why the focus right now, as you raised at the beginning, is really on artist safety. And as soon as we've got that determined and the union say, go forth, We've got, we've got space that we can configure indoors, outdoors to make it happen. Right. So what can you tell me at this point about the plays you're thinking of doing? I know you, you've mentioned that you've commissioned Jonathan Norton for a new work. Yeah, I can tell you a fair amount. I think we're still um, about a week or 10 days away from an official um, announcement that we'll send out to all our subscribers, all our ticket buyers that we'll share with all of you in the the press, and frankly, what's holding that up, we've got budgets and plans and calendars, and um, the whole season will be built around our acting company. They know their roles. But like I said, we really are still in those conversations with the unions to ensure safety. And so that, that's the thing that's kind of um, why you haven't you know, heard the formal official announcement. 
So I'll, um, I'll say as much as I can while still holding a few things back to try to make that moment um, an exciting moment for marketing when they're ready to formally share. But what we're hoping to do after Christmas Carol is uh, six more plays. One of them we've already talked about, which is our Public Works Dallas production next summer, um, which has is you know moved from from last summer. In addition to that, what we're looking at doing is um, two sets of plays that'll be in rep. So we're going to put our acting company, our Briarly Resident Acting Company, on contract for 35 consecutive weeks, and we'll pay them no matter what for that 35 weeks, so that they have income they can count on and trust whether that's virtual work or or live work and we're going to keep them busy during that time so they'll be performing a play at night and rehearsing another play sometimes we'll be doing those in rep two sets of rep which will get us four plays a couple times we'll be do we'll put all nine of them together in a play mm -hmm. and literally the way we've had to choose plays for the pandemic is we've asked two interlocking questions one is what maps on to the the you know bodies and acting um, experiences of these nine actors um, which, you know, normally we think, what stories do we want to tell? Here we thought, okay, so like, what can these actors be in? And then the other thing, equally, if not more important, was, okay, if we have to, which, what stories can be done where the actors are not closer than six feet to each other? So it's made some challenges, you know, um, musicals where folks aren't singing right at each other in character, but are kind of singing, you know, monologue kind of song suddenly becomes important. And we've, we've got one of those more kind of a musical review thing. Um, we wanted to do a new play, but um, we could not find, uh, we were in the midst of, we had already announced a couple new plays we wanted to do next year and in the future. None of those could be done with social distancing. Um, and these restrictions. So we went to our player in residence, Jonathan Dorton, and said, um, Jonathan, we need you to write a brand new play in three months, <laughs> it has, and it has to be for any mix of these nine actors, and it has to be able to occur during the pandemic, you know, during a coronavirus for the characters on stage, so that if necessary, they can wear masks and do social distancing. Um, I laid this out, I kind of laid that assignment out for Jonathan and then waited to hear the sound of him like, we were on the phone, of course, not in person, I waited to hear the sound of him like, you know, passing out from uh, the daunting challenge. <laughs> and he, and he just, it, it, you know, Jonathan, you know, his enthusiasm level is greater than mine at any moment, which is <laughs> saying a lot. He was like, I'm in, I'm in. So um, Jonathan's already done it. In a, in a matter of six, seven weeks, he wrote a full first draft. We were, uh, he and I are in the midst of the dramaturgical conversations and rewrites. We're going to do our first Zoom reading um, you know, in-house with our actors of the first draft in the next two weeks. And um, that play called The Cake Ladies is um, very specifically written. It's a play about uh, two, um, two women who um, have been uh, volunteers at their uh, uh, local community theater. They've been volunteers who um, bring baked goods, which is how they got named the Cake Ladies. Um, they bring you know, baked goods to the local community theater. And in March of 2020, when the coronavirus hits, they are in the midst at their community theater in a very small town in Texas. Their community theater is about to produce Angels in America. And um, that production can't happen because of the, they're shut down by the pandemic. And um, these two women, Liz Michael and Sally Vale, playing these characters that Jonathan specifically writing for them, determined that nothing is going to stop them or stop their, uh, their uh, community theater. And they're going to find a way to make Angels in America happen. So that, that's, that was kind of the initial conceit. And now that the play is developing, they actually have some, it's a, it's a comedy and it is meant to be about friendship and hope and community and art. But it, but it also, as we're working on it, it's responding to not only how the pandemic has changed and the world in which we live in, um, but also the resonance that comes up when you think about this plague and other plagues, like for instance, the AIDS plague mm -hmm. of the 80s and 90s that Tony Kushner's masterpiece was specifically referencing. And um, so it's, it's, I, it's a play that I think as it develops is, 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 is aspiring to be both a funny comedy with some really kind of awesome character roles for members of our company, some of whom will be, you know, crossing gender and playing multiple roles and doing some really fun stuff, as is the case also in Angels in America. Um, but also a play that'll touch on some, you know, the, the challenges that we live in now and the echoes of those challenges for those of us who've been live long enough of plagues past.
Yeah, yeah. And I love the fact that he picked as the play within the play uh, Angels, which of course is a very complicated work that you could not do under the current circumstances. Exactly. And that's why, you know, that was Jonathan's idea. And when, you know, he was, he was pitching me, he's like, okay, I think I've got this idea. And the second he said Angels in America, I was just like, oh my goodness, that is perfect in every way. Because kind of the immensity of the challenge of a small town in Texas, they're created, <laughs> you're saying, let's do Angels in America. That alone, you know, subject matter, style, the actual length, um, an angel crashing through the roof. Right. I mean, there, there have been cases of that trying to happen and the production being shut down because of outcry from the citizens. And uh, without giving too much away, that may actually be, uh, there, there may be some ghosts of that very <laughs> scenario in Jonathan's play. But in addition to that, we're, we're looking, you know, so basically we're thinking, what can we do in a pandemic within those very specific restrictions? And, 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 and then trying to pair up plays, you know, so that we can do them in rep, which originally we thought, well, if, for some reason, one of the plays needs to stop. I mean, if somebody gets sick, even if it has nothing to do with COVID, if just if an actor or crew member gets the seasonal flu in a non um, non serious way, but we'll need to stop. You know, just like Major League Baseball or anybody else, we'll need to stop and deal with that. So we thought, well, if we're working in rep with different teams of actors, we'll you know we have more flexibility to to kind of keep the show going. So. Um, so we've got, you know, um, uh, uh, a contemporary drama uh, that we're going to be doing that's by Dominique Morisot, one of the great um, contemporary Black writers of our time. She's just fabulous. We is it, is it Pipeline, we, which you had not to Pipeline. We were going to do Pipeline um, uh, right when the pandemic hit. We were in the first week of rehearsal of Pipeline, one of Dominique's great, really exciting plays. I'm certain that'll come back in a future season. But because of the specific casting needs of Pipeline, it just, we couldn't pop it into our our um, coronavirus season. We'll, we'll do a different one that we'll announce in a bit. We're going to do um, an Agatha Christie mystery. In my time in Dallas, we've never done um, either a mystery or an Agatha Christie play, but, um, but that'll be fun because we thought, well, we just, you know, mix it up and something that, uh, you know, there's, there's some murders and things, but luckily in Agatha Christie, usually the murders happen when the lights are out or at a distance <laughs> or you discover a dead body. So, you know, you don't have to get super intimate to kill somebody in an Agatha Christie play. <laughs> um, we, we've got a musical, like I said, more of a musical review, but that I think will speak to the current moment um, in a lot of powerful ways. But again, that actors could do with relative physical isolation and if needed, could be done with a fair amount of video projection and kind of singing straight out. Um, we've got um, the one play from the season we were going to do that had nothing to do with COVID that we are able to continue to do. The, the only one is um, Tiny Beautiful Things. And conveniently, Tiny Beautiful Things is a cast of four. And um, the play is written largely as letters, you know, letters, advice letters um, from Cheryl Strait. Originally in real life, Cheryl Strait was an advice, I was under a pseudonym, was an advice um, columnist. And so the play is structured that way. Our original vision for how that play would be staged when we were going to do it in the pre-coronavirus time would have had a lot of physical intimacy that even though the characters are writing, are communicating by email, I guess, not letters, but so they're literally in real life, they'd be isolated just sending email. We had originally intended that staging to be very, um, naturalistic and dialogic, you know, folks sitting down at a table, drinking coffee together, touching each other, sitting down on a couch. But luckily, since it's structured as emails and advice letters, we can stage it at physical distance for the actors. So that's the one play. I also like that play because it's a play, oh, I like it for a million reasons, but in the moment, I like that there are characters who are themselves isolated with their own challenges in their lives, not COVID challenges, but, but personal challenges who are reaching out in a kind of virtual sphere, you know, advice letters, emails, looking for human contact and for um, connection and navigating through those moments of pain and challenge. And um, I thought that was really powerful and moving before March. And I was eager for us to do that a year from now. But oh my goodness, during this pandemic, I'm just so unbelievably aware of how the computer screen has become this space where um, just personally I can reach out for connection and psychological um, you know, intimacy and 
support from people I love, but also in, at times in very surprising ways. Sometimes I'll have a, a Zoom meeting with somebody I've never met before. And just because of the world that we live in right now, it'll become um, very open and sometimes even very emotional um, in ways that I could not have mm. imagined before this crisis. Um, so it's, it's that mix of stuff, mysteries, comedies, new plays, musicals. It sounds like a normal Dallas Theater Center season, but it's not remote, <laughs> a Dallas Theater Center season. And on top of all of that, physically, the design challenge is we need to be in a proscenium. Everybody needs to be far apart. We have very few people on stage. Uh, we have very limited financial resources. It, it could be obvious with I mean, 30% audiences and no earned income for half a year. We had to cancel half the plays in our season last year. Um, but our production department heads, we, have, we haven't done any layoffs or any furloughs. Mm -hmm. One of the only um, large theaters in America that um, has kept our team together. We've been fundraising like crazy and taking all that money and just using it to just, you know, stay open, stay in virtual space, uh, keep, keep, keep everybody together. But so to make these plays, our whole production team will come together and we'll be designing and building and doing it with the simplest materials, but with hopefully the maximum amount of su visual surprise we can get out of that. So um, uh, we'll be building, you know, flat, simple, sh simple walls, but they'll be built out of projection material so that we can do rear projections and things like that to get maximum visual change and impact. Um, there will be some handcrafted stuff, some painting, of course, our costume shop will be sewing, but all of those things, as you can imagine, you know, we have a whole massive scene shop, for instance, and a big warehouse space. Well, the normal procedures that our carpenters use, for instance, to build all of our work from scratch and our painters, all of that, all of those have to be rethought just like anything else. Because you know, if in a scene shop, you might go and use a, a piece of equipment, you might walk away from it, somebody else comes over and on the project theater, they use the same, you know, the same table saw to make something else. Well, suddenly two people, you know, anybody's tools, any, any, um, and crossing spaces like that, all just normal workflow things are all things we have to rethink. So the physical productions won't be quite as big and grand as one would expect, but it'll still be designed, it'll still be acting, and we'll still be telling stories. I, I go back to the one time uh, years ago, you told me and maybe some other journalists, like your dream, because you do like to do things on a big scale, like yeah. your dream would be to do a show in AT&T Stadium. Like, <laughs> so, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that work out this time? Yeah, of course, when I, that, first of all, that remains a dream. I, I, nothing would make me happier when this pandemic is over than to think what is the largest, most expensive <laughs> thing we can do. But I do want to be clear, whenever I have had that dream, it has always involved a lot of people in that stadium. <laughs> and, <laughs> it's yeah. funny because the two things as an artist that I love the most, that um, for better or worse, I, you know, some of my critics would say there's sometimes uh, uh, you know, a, a weaker thing, and hopefully I've got, there are some folks who share my enthusiasm with this, but my two favorite things are to either go really big or to go super compressed and small. I probably have the least interest in kind of just a conventional, everybody sits next to each other, they look at something happen, they contemplate it, they go home. I respect that art, it's just not kind of, especially in my own personal work as a director, and of course the pandemic has made all of that impossible because, um, you know, moving into a compressed space where the audience and the actors are in, you know, kind of immediate proximity is not possible. And going big is, you know, yeah. no America is anybody going big, not just with theater, but with anything, as we can tell from watching, you know, sports in empty stadiums and, you know, large, massive museums with, you know, only a couple people in the, allowed in a gallery at any given moment, all of that. Yeah, yeah. So this will be your small compressed season. <laughs> yes, exactly. So a, a few more questions. Uh, you let's talk about some of the shows that were canceled. You mentioned Pipeline, uh, American Mariachi, which you guys actually were able to do a, I think, a final dress on and record right. or film. Uh, but it's a co-production with the Goodman, and they've announced it on their season. So, and then I'm assuming with travel restrictions, who knows what could happen as far as the Dallas cast, and then also. Um, uh, the Don Wen play, which was exciting because it involves a big Asian cast, which we haven't had here from you guys before. Yeah, so all of that stuff, yeah, we got shut down with multiple things. I mean, we had two shows in immediate 
uh, rehearsals and preparation at DTC, the Supreme Leader, the new play you were just talking about, and Pipeline. And we had um, American Mariachi, that cast was about to open in Dallas, and then immediately after closing in Dallas, they were to go to Chicago, including our acting company members who were in that show. Plus, we already had physically sent, not just the set, but the actors from our production of Little Women, which had just closed at the Kalita. Those folks, those actors, um, Sally and Alex and Liz, they were all in San Diego at the Old Globe where they were gonna perform Little Women. After four days in San Diego, they all got sent home with the pandemic and Mariachi went entirely virtual. We're hoping that Mariachi will indeed be able to happen in Chicago at some point in the next year and that that would include the, all the actors who are gonna do it in Dallas. So our company members and other Dallas actors as well as the Chicago actors. We're hoping that'll happen there, but again, the Goodman is in the same situation we all are, which is trying to figure out when to reopen, how to reopen, how to make that happen. And we're hopeful that Little Women will return to the Old Globe, though again, that could be this year or next year, or who knows. Um, I think there is, we are still con looking at the possibility of in a future season, uh, bringing American Mariachi back to Dallas so that it could happen live uh, for the folks who never got that, obviously nobody got to see it live, but a lot of folks never had the opportunity even to see it virtual. And it, it, we never finished that journey. We got through dress rehearsal, but we never even got to open it. And that's a show, it's a comedy, it's a very open-hearted play. It has amazing mariachi music throughout with live musicians. It's a play that needs a live audience and we never got to see it, not even once with a live audience. So that may come back in a future season based on calendars and availability and budgets. Um, and similarly, I, I could envision a world where Pipeline, which is largely about um, uh, public education, that, you know, that, it, that'll remain relevant and deep and true. And The Supreme Leader, which I was personally gonna direct, and it's a very funny play, and it's a very smart play, I just love it. We're gonna do the world premiere. I am desperate to, to get that back. But again, until I know when we can all travel again, uh, until I know when we can resume full-scale production with the full support that we need to bring to bear. I can't, um, like, like it's not even, I can't announce anything. Like yeah. behind the scenes, we truly have no idea. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the thing I've alluded to, but it's true for Dallas Theater Center, and it's true, I'm, I'm in weekly contact with the leaders of the other uh, large arts organizations throughout the Arts District, as well as in regular conversation with the theater leaders um, throughout North Texas here. And um, it's true, what's true for us is true for, for all of us, which is um, there's not only a health crisis, but there also is an economic crisis. And I pray that the health crisis is at or nearing its peak for the country and that what will be ahead is medical innovation that will help to move us slowly but surely out of this. But um, I fear that the economic crisis is a wave that is still yet to crest. Right. And I think a lot of industry experts from around the country are telling us to expect a two to three year um, uh, slow, gradual economic recovery for the arts, restaurants, movie theaters, uh, live sports, you know, all, all the things that require, the, whose business models require folks to physically come together. So, um, I, I mean, just, you know, frankly, the, the money that it takes to run a theater in good times, that's hard, really hard. We're not in good times. And that, that is, that's gonna, it's just, when we all are able to reopen in the arts, we're not gonna have the resources that we had until we're able to really get robust audiences back. And, and I'm, I'm sure you're incredibly concerned with that and thinking about that as well, Mark, because obviously that you're a huge part of that as well. Like you, you, you and I both share not only artistic passion, but also you know our, our professional lives are built around the idea that there are people out there in the world who want to experience live theater. And um, so we need them all to stay healthy, wear their masks, wash their hands, and then come back and engage with the art form as soon as it's safe to do so. <laughs> People who aren't wearing your mask, listen to this. Oh, yeah, exactly. Well, one last question. Uh, we just got some news today that one of your company members, Ace Anderson, is taking a little bit of a hiatus. 
Yeah, Ace and uh, Gabrielle, uh, his uh, fiance, they're moving out to um, LA to explore um, film and TV opportunities. Um, to be just totally personally honest, that breaks my heart because, um, well, for a couple of reasons. One is anybody who's watched my work as a director in the past three or four years, Ace has been in virtually everything I've directed and has been a really central role from the audience's perspective. He's been even more central behind the scenes. Um, there are some actors, some great actors in our company who um, in the rehearsal room, they innovate in their performance, they create internally, um, it's really awe-inspiring to watch, but um, but largely um, don't jump in on the bigger picture stuff that they're not in. If there's a scene they're not in, most of our company doesn't um, step forward and say, "Hey, here's a way to you know reblock that scene," or "Here's a creative solution to that problem." One of the things I absolutely loved about my years working with Ace is that um, whenever Ace was not on stage as an actor in the rehearsal process, he'd be out there watching. Um, and he'd be watching and I'd get stuck, a normal part of the creative process, at least for me. And I go, okay, I can identify the thing that needs to happen in the scene and I can see what we're doing. And I can't tell how to get the two things to line up. And invariably what would happen is Ace would walk over to me and he'd say, have you thought about this? And I'd say, thank you. And then I would put it in place and everybody would be like, Kevin, what a great idea. And then I'd be like, okay, honestly, it was Ace's idea. But, um, <laughs> so I'm gonna miss Ace as a collaborator in so many ways. Um, one of the things the pandemic has done for artists, I mean, it's most, honestly mostly what the pandemic done is deep, deep, deep damage. Artists don't have employment and um, uh, national unemployment uh, uh, support is small and Texas is especially brutal. And so artists are really in, in danger. But if there is a good side, it's that artists who have interest in video work, in creating their own work, in putting out digital work, or who are interested in doing auditions for film and TV, or for agents and managers, things like that, casting directors in a digital sphere, folks who have that interest or expertise, there's at least the opportunity for them to keep practicing their art. And um, Ace is a skilled uh, filmmaker and a, a video artist in his own right, separate from his acting work on stage. And um, it, during the pandemic was, was able to also do video auditions. You know, that, that didn't stop him from doing that. So he's been able to find some opportunities he wants to pursue out in California. Um, as always, when they leave and our company members uh, do move on, I'm happy for them. And I'm also eager for the moments they return. And <laughs> some of them get so successful elsewhere that they're only able to come back for a fundraising gala or a live performance in a play every three or four years. Like but, Cedric. Uh, exactly, yep. Uh, and I'm, I've been blessed in the pandemic to be able to see Cedric a couple times performing because, uh, you know, even though he's in the West End performing, but because of the video, um, because all, all theater is now online. But yeah, he's doing great over there. And, um, and we have a couple other company members who in the next year or two will have some national opportunities that I'm happy for them for, but I hate that they're leaving. Yeah. Um, but the biggest thing this means we picked the season, assuming Ace would be in it, our, our um, COVID season. So, um, so we will be looking to fill the roles that he otherwise would have played in the season. So it means we'll have opportunity to welcome somebody else into our acting company for the season. Right, right. Uh, yeah, one thing I didn't mention was about the, the se this past season, and I, I wrote about this several times, but it was the first season uh, since you've been here, and probably ever for the Dallas Theater Center or any theater, all of your shows, except for Christmas Carol and Shakespeare, were by women or and or people of color. Oh, wow. You know what? I hadn't... Because I, uh, Holland Taylor with Anne and, yeah, and sure. women and... yeah. First of all, I'm proud of that. And uh, second of all, the Shakespeare uh, all the work show that we're going to do uh, is co-written by uh, Kwame Kwerma, who is an African-American um, adapter and director and artist, and the score by Shana Taub, who is um, an awesome composer. So e even even with Shakespearean source material, um, uh, yeah, that that um, it's our efforts to continually interrogate ourselves and find our ways that we are not being equitable, diverse, and inclusive. Those are real. They're sometimes very painful. They certainly have continued to be both challenging and painful throughout the um, 
very necessary national reckoning around race that's been going on. Um, so, so that's conscious on our part. It's not, um, it's not accidental, but it also at its best is at its best. And we are not always at our best. I don't want to imply otherwise, but when we are at our best, I feel like it's, it, it's a part of who we are and who in relation to our community. And so, um, sometimes it even goes unremarked, um, at its worst, there are blind spots and we need people to hold us accountable and point out those um, moments of choice, conscious and sometimes unconscious, that, um, that are perpetuating racist systems. So, right. um, and again, the, it hasn't been any different for us than for everybody else in the pandemic, which is you know, really taking time in our Zoom rooms um, you know, sometimes out on the street, I've been able to get out there a couple times to do some marching, sometimes in contemplation and reading and national dialogues through Zoom, and, um, and a lot with our staff. You know, the one advantage of keeping everybody on, on fully paid this whole entire time is that everybody has an eight-hour workday, five days a week, and so we've been able to take time where our electricians and our props makers and our customers and our development folks and our marketers would often in a very busy day would be spent building stuff or advertising plays. We've been able to take many, 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 many hours every week for our uh, staff to be gathering in Zoom rooms and shared reading, shared watching of videos, and so frankly, some really challenging conversations. Sure. And you're responding to things not only with the marches, but the We See You White American Theater movement, which is you know, very important and is, is, is a lot of people are talking about. And I know everyone made a lot of statements about Black Lives Matter, but you know the, the work is still to come. You've got to prove that you're actually making changes. Absolutely. And that, the, you know, the document, the We See You White American Theater document is one of the greatest gifts to be handed to the field as a whole. Um, uh, certainly since I've been working in the field, that doesn't mean it's without uh, challenge for you know, the white folks like me to read it because there are moments that I very, very explicitly see myself in that. And, um, and that's painful. And, um, but also it's an incredible opportunity because it, it lays out, hey, you can either be on the side of anti-racism or on the side of racism. And those decisions and choices are made not in a general, how do we all feel moment. They're made in specific detailed actions. And that document lays out and challenges us. It says, hey, if you, really, if you really believe what you say you believe, put policies like this into place and ensure that you live up to them. And some of those policies we're already doing some of those policies we have in place, but honestly, are only half doing. And some of those policies are definitely not in place at Dallas Theater Center. And so we are working our way through every single line of that document. And my goal is that we adopt all of those policies, that we live up to those every second that we can. And that when we fail, the um, theater journalists, uh, uh, theater staff members, that our audiences, that our board, that our community holds us accountable and says, um, hey, if you really believe what you're saying, you just, you know, you need to fix this, you know, you need to make this choice. So I, I, again, I can't say that every moment of this has been um, filled with joy, but it feels like such a gift of an opportunity and um, amidst this horrible, horrible pandemic, the racial reckoning feels like it may be the thing when we look back at 2020 years from now that we hold up as the good that um, came out of this otherwise really, really bad time. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Kevin. And I'll look forward to talking to you again, maybe about the next season or the first show that you're able to do and to seeing it in person if possible. Yes, and, and Mark, more than anything else, uh, what I want is to see you in person and <laughs> shake your hand and have no masks on and have no fear of coronavirus because it is in the past and we are all healthy and together again. So until then, thank you for everything you're doing to keep theater alive in North Texas. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Take care. Be well. All right.